24 Planning Commission meeting. I'll call this meeting to order at 7 p.m. Ms. Jones, will you please call the roll? Mr. Miner? Present. Mr. King? Present. Mr. Hayes? Present. Mr. Allen? Here. Present. Do list? Ms. Schilling? Ms. Williams? Here. Mayor Anderson? Present. Thank you. Please feel free to join me for tonight's prayer and pledge. My God, I thank you for the many blessings that you provided me and my family. We ask you to be with us tonight within our community and our country. We ask for your guidance. It is in your name that I pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Do I have, have a motion? Motion. Second. Second. McDonald. Kelly. Uh, call for the vote, please. Mr. McDonald? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Pate? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Schilling? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Bagner? Aye. Mayor Anderson? Aye. Approval. Is accepted. Next on the item or the agenda is citizens' comments. Uh, Ms. Jones, do we have uh, somebody listed on? We tonight? have one. Oh, sorry. Bart Nash. Sir, could you state your name and address for the record, please? Yeah. My name is Bart Nash. I live at 7128 Elrod Road. Uh, all right. We we welcome your comments tonight. We just try to ask all citizens to keep it to three minutes, if you will, please. I don't get the full 15. <laughs> I, I think I can keep it to three. Thank you, sir. I do appreciate your time. I do want to be respectful of that. I uh, have lived there on Elrod Road <clears throat> for a while. In fact, I was around in, uh, in 2008 when the original plan for what's now uh, the Bellhaven development was being discussed. That's what I'd like to talk to you a bit about tonight. The, uh, uh, been a fair amount of contentious discussion around that development you know, from day one, but Basically, it was approved at that time uh, with the belief that the Water Authority of Dixon was going to bring uh, enough sewer capacity to do all the development that Fairview wanted to do for the future and the amount of development that that amount of uh, capacity that that development needed. Only thing that was discussed around you know, sewer capacity for that development then was traditional gravity-fed municipal sewer. That was the only thing that was as far as I know, was being discussed in Fairview at all at that time. So that's what was approved. That's what the original plan was. Property changed hands a few times since then. Uh, but as it stands today, as far as I understand, Water Authority Dixon still is not going to provide uh, traditional sewer capacity that's capable of supporting that development as originally planned. So with it being impossible to develop the plan develop the property according to the original plan. New plan came before the uh, planning commission in December. Uh, that was presented by the developers, brought to you guys, and argument was made that it was significantly compliant with the original plan. Uh, and in fact, it was approved with the assumption, belief that it was sub substantially compliant with the original plan, in spite of changes to street layouts and lot layouts and more, more specifically, that it no longer contained uh, plans for traditional sewer system, but an on-site step system. And it all hinged among several factors, but one of the main ones was around whether or not that was a uh, change of, of, of land use. So the decision was made that it wasn't, and that it was substantially compliant. Uh, so say you guys got a lot of hard work to do <laughs> to make decisions around these sort of things. Uh, but I'd like you to consider whether or not that was an appropriate decision uh, in that 
the development clearly intended to be you know, traditional sewer originally. Uh, you, you can go, you can base on the size of the pipes they had, the fact that there was uh, pumping stations all over the property, you know, all that was removed and property that had been set aside for housing was now set aside for the step system. Uh, there really wasn't any way to do that system in the original plan. Argument was made that this was somehow substantially compliant, even though I think most people logically would say putting a step system on property that used to have houses is, is change in land use. So the current zoning ordinance gives clear instructions for how to include these type of systems when you're planning a development. It requires that they be part of the original master development plan. It specifically requires uh, that green space that'll be used for step systems be designated as to that use on the original plan. And you guys are aware if a plan changes significantly, it's supposed to come back as a new plan, go back before the Board of Commissioners. And I believe that's what should have happened with this plan then. Uh, other developments that have included on-site sewage, as far as I know, have all included that as part of the original development plan. No one's ever come back and changed that at a later point, as far as I know. I did a, a bit of research and couldn't find any, any, any plants that had changed in that way. So I think sound logic could lead you to, should lead you to conclude that this was not substantially compliant as the decision was made in December. And uh, my understanding is the developer is now trying to get you to remove some of the agreements that they made in December in order to get the plan approved then. So uh, I'd like you to consider that this property really still cannot be developed in a way that's significantly compliant with the original plan. And the right thing to do is have this plan go back through as a new master development plan. Uh, really just can't go forward with the type of development they need to do under today's uh, capacities and the technology that's available for processing sewage under a plan that was devised in 2008. And you can't make a plan that works that way compliant with the one from 2008. So. Mr. Nash, I apologize, but if you could wrap up your comments. I, I am wrapped up right now. That's, Thank you that's, very much. That's the summary of my point that uh, I'd like you to consider if any way possible that, and the main thing is that that decision set a precedent basically that says Water Authority Dixon and developers can decide to put sewage treatment on any residential property in Fairview. That's what you can conclude from the logic that was used to approve this in December. So that's a dangerous precedent. We thank you for your comments tonight. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Do we have a motion on that? Motion to approve. Second. Donald Cowley. McDowell, would you please call the, the vote? Mr. McDonald? Aye. Mr. Callie? Aye. Mr. Pate? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Schilling? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Wagner? Aye. Mayor Anderson? Aye. Thank you. We have no items of old business, so we'll move directly into new business. First item is PC Resolution PC 33-24, Final Plat Bush Creek Subdivision 37.21 20, uh, acres. This is Map 23, Parcel 51. Current zoning is RS-15. Property owner is AI Home Builders. Um, do we have a motion? Make a motion to approve PC 33-24. Callie, do we have a second? Second. Mr. Pape. Mr. Greer, would you please read the staff report? Allison Corolla with T Squared Engineering has submitted on behalf of A1 Home Builders a final plat for the entirety of the Brush Creek subdivision. Brush Creek is a residential subdivision development consisting of 45 lots, two new public rights of way, four open spaces three detention ponds and all necessary stormwater and wastewater infrastructure. The proposed land use within Brush Creek subdivision is single family detached residential. The parcel tax map 23 parcel 51.00 is zoned RS 15 single family residential and contains 37.21 acres. The property for Brush Creek subdivision is not located within a flood hazard area. 
The development occupies most of the parcel within the southern portion of the property where the presence of severe topography is minimal compared to the northern portion of the parcel. The developer has designed the subdivision to minimize the impact of the severe topography. The design and layout contain three stormwater detention ponds, four open spaces. The two open spaces located in the western portion of the property encompass the area of severe topography. The two open spaces are in the northeast corner with an area of steep topography between lots eight and nine. The four open spaces in total are 16.33 acres. The surrounding properties, the properties to the north and west are located within Williamson County and are zoned MGA-1 and MGA-5 and contain single family residences. The properties to the south are zoned RS40, single family residential, R20, one and two family residential, and commercial general. The R20 zone lots are located within section two of Brush Creek subdivision. The RS40 lots have frontage onto Fairview Boulevard, Tennessee Highway 100, and are located within section one of Brush Creek subdivision. The commercial general zone properties are located to the southeast of the proposed Brush Creek subdivision and is the location of Elantra Gate Systems. The Fairview Forward 2040 Comprehensive Plan designates this property as rural settlement. The rural settlement classification notes the appropriate land use are agriculture and single family detached residential. The classification lists several zone districts as appropriate. I will note that RS15 is the existing zoning. It was in place prior to the 2040 uh, comprehensive plan. And so this does not fall within the appropriate zone districts per the 2040 plan, but it was zoned that way prior to the adoption of the 2040 comprehensive plan. The appropriate zones are R AR15, AR5, RS40 or RSM40. Staff recommends the Planning Commission approve the final plat for Brush Creek subdivision in order to create 45 single family residential lots, extend Fairlawn Drive, create two new public rights of way, Brush Creek Lane and Brush Creek Court, install a cluster mailbox and associated parking areas, create four open spaces, create three detention ponds and install all necessary stormwater, water and wastewater infrastructure as resubmitted on September 24th, 2024. Thank you, Mr. Greer. Do we have do we have a representative tonight? Thank you. Could you please uh, state your name and company? Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. I'm Allison Carolla from T Square Engineering. We're at 111 Southeast Parkway Court in Franklin. I'm here to answer any questions um, that you may have um, on behalf of the developer. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I'll open this up for uh, Planning Commission comments or questions. I have one. Yes, um, can you just give us a recap of your um, wastewater and stormwater mechanisms and how you plan on to keep those amenities safe for our citizens here in Fairview? Yeah, absolutely. So um, all of our stormwater and grading areas comply uh, are in full compliance with the stormwater manual regulations. Um, they regulate that all of our ponds have at least one foot of freeboard at the 100-year storm. And so um, that's important because even at the 100-year storm, effectively we're saying that we're not flooding any of these houses, we're not discharging onto in, any of the other properties at a higher rate than what is currently um, discharging. So that kind of addresses the stormwater piece of that. Uh, the sanitary piece of this um, is actually is a part of this development, uh, WADC required us to upgrade the existing pump station um, and effectively relocating the existing pump station. So there is an existing pump station um, just on the highway um, on the other side of Brush Creek where it, it ties in with the highway. Um, that pump station is failing effectively and is terribly unsafe. I'm sure you guys have driven by and you know are aware of the location and the, the immense slopes um, that surround it. And so it's unsafe for WADC vehicles um, to pull in. And so as a part of this development, WADC asked us to create a regional pump station on our site. So effectively, this pump station does not just serve this development. This pump station reroutes all of the sanitary that is currently going to that pump station, treats all of it on our property through our pump station, and then sends it back to the existing line that runs along the highway. 
So um, this was a much larger pump station than you would typically see um, on just a 45 lot development because we're including the flow of the rest of the homes in order to um, make sure that all the residents in Fairview have, have adequate sewer. Thank you. Yes, Sam, did that answer your question appropriately? Yeah. Any other comments, questions? All right, thanks, thanks, Ms. Corolla. Thank you. Ms. Howe, will you please call the vote? Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Pape? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Schilling? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Bagner? Aye. Mayor Anderson? Aye. Mr. McDonald? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries eight to zero. Next on the, the agenda tonight is a PC resolution PC 34-24. This is to remove the condition of approval number three from PC 40-23 Bellhaven, which is a 251 acre map 21 parcel 21 and map 18 parcel 41. Current zoning is RM8 PUD. Property owner is WUSF4 Bellhaven LLC. Do we have a motion on the floor for PC 34-24? I make a motion that we find the development plan submitted with this development plan application to not be in substantial compliance with the controlling documents. Mr. Pape, that's an inappropriate motion. The request tonight is to remove the condition Three, and that's the request that's before this planning commission. This planning commission only has the power under the zoning code and only can respond to applications. The so an appropriate motion would be either to uh, affirm the request and remove it, to modify the condition, or to deny the request. The, the applicant submitted a development plan application. It's listed in the staff report as a development plan application. I don't find anything in our ordinance that permits or anything in our procedures or any application that we have that allows for simply the removal of a condition. Also, so the motion I don't would be to deny the condition. That's the appropriate motion, not, well, to, not to, but the not challenge the is, that you made. The challenge with that is if we're, if we're going to simply remove the condition, then we're going to assume that the underlying approval still would have been the same. A conditional approval, the condition is put in place before that was voted on. So this and so, can well, can I finish, please? Um, you're assuming, and nobody can know how that vote would have turned out if that condition was not part of that approval. Also, there are people on this board who were not there that night who likely you know, may not have voted for it in any way at all. Me personally, if, if I vote either way on this for removing the condition or not, it could be construed that I somehow support that it is in, in substantial compliance, with their, which they're clearly not. And I, 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 uh, as a planning commission, we can make a motion to act any way we want if we're no, acting no, you reasonably. You have, to, you have to rely on the applications that are made before you, and your yeah, authority and it's as a development plan application is strictly under the zoning code. The application mm -hmm. request tonight is to remove the condition. You can either approve the removal of the condition, deny the uh, condition, or modify the condition, or you can abstain from voting if you don't feel like you can vote. So where, any, in, the, where in the zoning are fine. Where in the zoning ordinance does it allow for an application for only removal of a condition versus a development plan it's, application? It's Tennessee state law, and that's the request they've made tonight. If you do not like the request, then you can vote to deny it. Mm -hmm. But At, the okay. motion you made is inappropriate. As a point of order, uh, Mr. Pape, um, As a restatement here, the planning commission is an administrative body. So our actions are resulted into a recommendation to the board of commissioners who will then act as our legislative body for the city. So my recommendation is we need to act on a motion that addresses the condition, which is what is, is, is on the docket here, the, the agenda which we reviewed we all voted on and approved we all didn't vote on it but yes voted on the agenda for tonight which right. which in the agenda is as stated we are voting on this condition number three so I, I, I agree with mr. Carter we either have to approve it deny it 
or recommend a modification. And again, this is a modif this is a recommendation to the board of commissioners, which actually it's not in this case, it's a removal of our condition um, one way or the other, but I made a motion. If nobody seconds it, that's, that's up to everybody. So that's, that's my motion. We have a second on Mr. Pape's motion. Okay, initial motion does not carry. Do I hear another motion? I'll make a motion to deny. A motion to deny. Second. Oh. Donald Callie. Great. Um, Mr. Greer, would you please read the staff report? Bellhaven is a proposed neighborhood on 251 acres containing a mixture of single family detached residential residential residences and attached townhomes. Also, the neighborhood contains a 2.61 acre location for an amenity center, along with 1.25 miles of walking trails. Of the 251 acres, 90.75 acres, 36% of the site is designated as open space with an additional 30.09 acres set aside for a sanitary drip field. The neighborhood contains 484 total homes on three different sized single family detached lots. The lot sizes are type A, 95 by 150, type B, 75 by 130, and type C, 57 by 120. The overall density of the proposed neighborhood is 1.93 units per acre. Mr. Sean Henry has submitted a request on behalf of DR Horton to remove condition of approval number three from planning commission resolution number 40-23. That, that resolution is on the screen tonight with the condition of approval listed. The development plan for Bellhaven development was approved by the Planning Commission at the December 9th, 2023 meeting. The Planning Commission approved the Planning Commission resolution number 4023 that contained three conditions of approval related to the Bellhaven development. Staff included one of the conditions of approval, which is the development plan shall be vested for three years from the date of approval. This condition of approval was retained as part of the project approval and the Planning Commission added two additional conditions of approval. Condition of approval number two, that was added by the Planning Commission is revise and resubmit traffic impact studies with each phase. Condition of approval number three that was added by the Planning Commission is development agreement approval required by BOC regarding share of road improvements before any final plat is recorded or approved. To comply with condition of approval number three, the developer has submitted two different development agreements for review and consideration by the Board of Commissioners. The first development agreement was presented at the May 16th, 2024 Board of Commissioners meeting along with resolution 2224. Following discussions, the development agreement was deferred. The following month at the June 6th, 2024 Board of Commissioners meeting, resolution 2224 was brought back before the BOC with a revised agreement. The revision to the agreement was the developer's contribution amount had increased from 2.5 million to 2.75 million. Following in-depth discussions, the Board of Commissioners voted to not approve the development agreement. On August 30th, 2024, a letter from Mr. Sean Henry was submitted to the Planning Department requesting the Planning Commission to consider removing condition of approval number three from resolution number 40-23. That letter was provided to you through IDT um, and uh, you've had ample time to review that over the last few weeks. The staff recommendation is due to this request being related to a condition of a of, due to this request being related to a condition of approval added by the Planning Commission as part of the approval of the development plan at the Tuesday, December 9th, 2023 Planning Commission. Staff is not providing a recommendation. Tonight you were also handed a letter, an email provided uh, to myself, um, City Attorney Patrick Carter, Mr. Pitts representing DR Horton, and uh, Miss Tiffany, I'm gonna butcher her last name, with Reagan Smith, um, and the email states, Ethan attached, please find a new memo for the Bellhaven traffic engineer, summarizing the previously approved traffic impact study. 
that memo was provided on Reagan Smith, uh, the Reagan Smith document along with this email. The roads surrounding the project uh, remain in need of improvement for current traffic even if Bellhaven is never built. Point two, the Bellhaven traffic impact study recommends turn lanes and traffic signal at the intersection of Northwest Highway and Highway 96 without traffic from the Bellhaven development. The city intends to add turn lanes as part of the Northwest Highway improvements, but a commitment to fund and perform that road wo roadway work is uncertain. Item three, DR Horton will be required to construct its entrance from Highway 96 to TDOT standards, including a right turn lane, left turn lane into the development. All other Bellhaven streets linking existing city roads will be built to the city of Fairview standards. Four, there is no rationale nexus, no rough proportionality for the city to require DR Horton to construct or pay for improvements that already need to be made for existing traffic. That need is not arising from Bellhaven's traffic impact. Mr. Henry states, my client reiterates the current request to remove condition number three from PC resolution 4023. However, if the planning commission desires to replace that condition, DR Horton will accept the following substitute text. Quote, if the city of Fairview does not construct the turn lanes and traffic signal at the intersection of Highway 96 and Northwest Highway, Jingo Road, then DR Horton will install these roadway improvements when permitted by TDOT, end quote. And Mr. Henry is here tonight to answer any questions along with representatives from DR Horton. Thank you, Mr. Greer. Do we have a representative tonight of the applicant? Sir, would you please state your name and company? Sir, Chairman, Mayor, members of the Planning Commission, my name is Sean Henry. I represent D.R. Horton. Representatives of D.R. Horton are here tonight, uh, as well as the property owner, uh, the Walton Group. Yes, we, we filed this application after really running into a brick wall to satisfy the condition uh, that, uh, that we're talking about here tonight. That brick wall being the Board of Commissioners really would not approve the development agreement that uh, we had negotiated in good faith and presented to that board. And so we could not and still cannot get that development agreement approved. So that leaves us with a condition of approval by this commission that cannot be satisfied. And so we're in front of you, uh, and I realize there's, there's new faces on this commission since I was here last, so welcome. Welcome to the Planning Commission. But uh, our objective here tonight is simply to raise the issue in front of you that when the Planning Commission imposes a condition that cannot be satisfied by the applicant, we have nowhere else to turn. And so we've come back to you to explain to you that uh, the development agreement uh, as written uh, and required cannot be accomplished, cannot be satisfied. And just as a, as a backup, uh, just as a rewind for a second, <clears throat> we now have, as uh, Mr. Greer just pointed out, and, and actually I'd like to, like to, I guess it's already filed for the record, but to the extent that it's not, I just want to be sure that this updated letter dated today, this is a memo from Tiffany Reed. Uh, she simply is summarizing with a fresh date, you know, today's date, what she had already prepared and submitted to the city and which was approved and in reliance on that traffic impact study, as you can see, the development plan uh, was, was reapproved last year and has a vested right um, for the next three years. And in this letter, she simply points out the traffic impact study conclusions are still applicable. And the only true impact that, that uh, this project has is at the intersection of Northwest Highway and, and 96. And we understand that the city is planning in some form to make improvements there. And so what DR Horton is committed to do is we'll, we'll satisfy our traffic impact by installing the turn lanes at that intersection and the traffic light at that intersection. And the whole reason we got into a development agreement in the first place was the concern that if the city's marching forward with a roadway improvement project, including that intersection, it makes little sense to have the developer go out there and do it and then the city comes back later and maybe tears up what's been installed and redoes it as part of their overall streetscape improvement project 
which is not only that intersection, but runs down Northwest Highway for some distance. So the purpose of the development agreement was let's not have the city and the developer trying to do the same thing. Let's come to an agreement whereby the city simply, instead of doing the work, would pay that contribution into the city. City takes those funds and uses those funds for, for its road rate project. But, but the, the, the impact and the valuation of the impact of D.R. Horton is tied to that intersection and that intersection only. Uh, the study uh, concludes that there's not enough traffic generation coming from the Bellhaven development uh, to require any turn lanes at Elwod, Elrod Road, at Dice Lampley Road, at Cox Pike, and at the project access point with Northwest Highway. So that's the conclusion of the traffic engineer. And to date, there's been no countervailing evidence to contradict that. There's been nothing submitted in the record in front of this planning commission, in front of the board of commissioners twice, by licensed engineers, licensed traffic engineers to, to, to step up and say, that traffic impact study that was approved uh, is, is incorrect. And I would, I would venture to submit that there's probably not any of that evidence tonight. So we're here because our client wants to move forward with a development that's been approved. It's been approved. And we want to, we want to move forward and get this, thing, get this thing going. So that's my summary. I'm happy to answer any questions. And if you have detailed questions, you know, I probably can't answer any, any real specifics. But the team is here and, and can help, particularly anyone that was not on the commission uh, last year when we, were, when we were here. So thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, Mr. Henry. I have a couple quick Sure. Opening comments for the Planning Commission. Uh, Mr. Carter, in your um, opinion, is it a common condition that a requirement such as this being a development agreement between an applicant and a city to be established uh, for cost terms, is that a customary act? When there's work to be coordinated, uh, such as required improvements, uh, yes, it would be a typical agreement where the work is not being done by the city and the developer, and they're not working at cross purposes. And, and that really is the, the main thrust of the condition, but also that the dollar amount, if depending on who does the work, if the city is going to do the work as part of the larger Northwest Highway project, or if the city is not, then it would make sense for the developer to do that work. But that's that was really why that condition was added uh, by this body uh, at that time. And as far as I know, that that, that has not changed. Okay. The city still plans to pursue Northwest Highway, and there needs to be some resolution between the city and the developer on the work, how much it's going to cost. In your opinion, if this condition were to be either uh, removed or reaffirmed, is there still a continued shared responsibility by both the applicant and the city that would have to be resolved by the Board of Commissioners moving forward? I, I think if the Board of Commissioners, as, as far as I know, still wish to move forward with the Northwest Highway project. so. It, it, it needs to be resolved between this developer and the uh, city on when that work is going to occur, who's going to do the work, uh, and how much that work is going to cost. Um, I think the traffic study tells us that that work is going to cost about 1.3 or 1.4 million. Our planner and our engineer have, have looked at that. Uh, they can, um, I, and they spoke at length at prior meetings they can agree with this point or agree or not agree with this point but uh, in the big picture there's not there's not much movement on that number um, the developer has did indeed for a development agreement that the Board of Commissioners to this point has not accepted um, and so I, I think that answers your question in a roundabout way perhaps it does thank you sir uh, just a couple other quick questions just to try to establish our our topic here. Mr. Henry, with the uh, conditional approval established in December of last year, the first offer 
or, or agreement draft that was presented by the applicant to the city wasn't until May. That's five months. Um, you know, we're, we're now sitting at 10 months from the original condition, almost a year. Why the delay in having that initial offer presented if time is of the essence? Yeah, I can't explain that. I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Okay. So. There were previous offers, though, correct, by the applicant um, as far as when I say offer uh, listed burdens that the applicant was willing to pay towards the shared arrangements, correct? Yes, and, and let me just clarify that, that this planning commission did not dive into what the elements of the development agreement Agreed. would or would not contain. And that's I'm just why. trying to establish because yeah. it's, it's brought back to our commission. So we're yeah. just trying to understand the facts so we can correctly make our decision. My, yeah, my understanding, I was not involved in those meetings, but uh, there were meetings between the engineering staff and, and our, our client and staff to figure out how do we arrive at an equitable number. Um, and that's what those meetings were about. And yeah, there was some challenge in trying to figure out how do, how do we arrive at that figure? How do we arrive at what that's going to be? Okay. And, and, but, but the point is, it was arrived. It was arrived. So the development agreement had a figure in it, agreed to by staff, city staff. So both development agreements had a figure agreed to by staff, so. The only thing I would say about that is staff obviously, and I'm talking about uh, Ben and others on staff, but they, they don't have the ability to agree to anything. They can work and, and arrive at arrive at a number that they believe uh, is is uh, appropriate, and then present it to the BOC. Um, but I think agree is the wrong word, Mr. Yeah, Henry. No, I agree. I thank you. Uh, thank you for that clarification. That, that's absolutely true. And then my last clarification, then I'll open it up for comments, questions. You you made a statement, Mr. Henry, that the the agreement cannot be satisfied between the applicant and the Board of Commissioners. In your opinion, is it unsatisfactory because one party doesn't agree with the value amount or that it's reached a point where you've, you've exceeded the ability to have a development agreement? Could you just clarify your statement of why it's unsatisfactory? Well, at this point? It'd be, it'd be, there was an open book attitude at the Board of Commissioners. The, that the check that the checkbook was going to be open and and at some point the developer is just going to have to pay the ransom or decide not not to do that project and in this case they still want to do the project and they're coming back to this board to let you know that the the amount that was in two development agreements which increased each time was not approved and, and Talked about. I mean, we don't want to get in, bog you down with valuations. I think that's that's beyond the scope of what this this you know this session is about. But what's important is the law kicks in when there's an exaction being demanded of a developer or property owner that is in far excess of the impact of the development project, and that's what we finally. The, you know, my client said, okay. We're exceeding that reasonable contribution to, to off-site roadway improvements. So, so, the, so they, there has to be a connection, whatever the figure is. Right, the figure's not important. Right, and, and nor is it really to this commission either. But so it's unsatisfactory because the applicant and the board of commissioners didn't come to an agreement. So it's brought back to the planning commission, Mr. Carter. Since this commission has no legal action regarding that step. So, I mean, this this commission is an administrative uh, body of appointed officials. None of you were elected. Uh, I know that the mayor was elected, but not in her role as the uh, a planning commissioner. And same thing with Mr. McDonald. This is an, an appointed body. Uh, this is not a body that can make, uh, that can enter into contracts or agree on sums of money. Uh, this body's authority is strictly limited to um, the, the zoning and development code. And so, I mean, that's that's back to where we started. This body can either 
agree to remove the condition, can agree to not, or can vote to not remove the condition and leave it as it is. This, this board could modify the condition, perhaps, or, uh, and those would be the three main choices. All right, thank you, Mr. Carter. So, as a reminder to this planning commission, as I open this up, we are talking about the condition that was placed here. We, we cannot establish values, cost of burden, or time that that would be um, you know in, an, in a development type agreement so um, comments questions I have a question Williams um, I appreciate your analysis thank you I'm just curious um, if there was a conflict with cost why would we add the addendum that DR Horton will accept the following subtext in the last sentence will install these roadway improvements when permitted by TDOT. Oh, you're referring to my email today. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and I'm sorry that you're asking, what, so, so the, the point of this text is to put definition on really what condition number three does not define. Okay, the, the condition number three is just, so, go figure out a development agreement that you can agree on with the Board of Commissioners. What we're suggesting is let the buck stop here with this planning commission because you are an administrative uh, body reviewing, reviewing a planned development, not a zoning, it's not a rezoning issue, it's not a legislative process. And so that condition is so undefined, what we're suggesting is if you wanna define it and tie it to the traffic impact study that was approved, we're happy to do that. And so that language is really just taken out of this today's le today's letter from the traffic engineer, uh, Ms. Tiffany Reed. And that text is putting into your resolution what the TIS is requiring anyway, which which means D.R. Horton will go out there and make those roadway improvements at that intersection, and of course it requires TDOT approval because TDOT controls how state route. 96. I thought it was a substitute that you were adding. It, it can be. It can okay. be. It, it absolutely. As what I was suggesting is the developer cannot live with the condition as written. And so what we're asking you to do is remove the condition. If there's no support for removing that condition, we're offering you a substitute text that would be acceptable. I'm sorry, I wouldn't, that wasn't clear. Thank you. Uh, I've got a couple questions. First directed at the uh, city staff. Can you provide a definition of the scope of work referred to as the roadway improvements that DR Horton was supposed to share the monetary value of? Yeah, I can. It's, it, the TI says that, that the turn lanes and traffic signal Highway 96 and Northwest Highway I guess I'm Need talking be about before this email came through. That that, that's, that has always been what the TIS said. So and so, but but, but what city staff did, and, and knowing that the city was going to engage in a, a redevelopment or a redoing of Northwest Highway, this this part of the work is would be part of the Northwest Highway, um, and so what the developer did is they and knowing and this work in dollars six months ago would cost about 1.4 million. Um, the developer, in order to try to move the project forward, offered an additional sum and told the city you can use the money to do this and then any other part of it on this Northwest Highway that you want to. But that's where the rub has been with the BOC, is just over the amount. Right. And I've made a recommendation to the BOC um, that's not really part part of this meeting. In, in, in the, not not this board's concern but I, I think that answers your question uh, yes I mean I, I it was my understanding that there was a lot more improvement upon Northwest farther down not necessarily just at the intersection but um, and and my, I mean kind of leads into my second question of what is the standard and what is the precedence that we've set for developments as far as roadway improvements directly in front of their developments where their where their property runs along the road. The, the law says that when a developer builds a development, 
there's a traffic study done, and the traffic study will show what the increase in traffic will be because of that particular development and the number of units and the trip count, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's a, an entire science that I don't pretend to understand or, or be even proficient in. Uh, but what the traffic study concluded is that uh, that it did not change the rating of those intersections further down and that the improvements that were required by this traffic study are the ones uh, to the turn lanes and the traffic signal. Uh, but the city, as part of a larger project, wants to widen and improve um, Northwest Highway further down. That, and, and that traffic, or that, that, that's not really, this developer hasn't caused that need. That need pre-existed, this developer. And I understand that. I, I'm, I guess I'm speaking more to, um, and I mean, Ethan, maybe you can jump in as far as, you know, looking at the Cumberland Estates, looking at the Aiden Woods developments <clears throat> along Crowcut where they're adding curb and gutter, repaving the road, doing improvements like that. Um, not necessarily what's, what is coming out of the traffic impact study, but um, just kind of what we've set as a standard of the city. I mean, what, is, what does that typically look like, Ethan? Typically, developments have added curb and gutter and improved their side of the road frontage that they have along their existing right-of-way um, that exists currently within the city. You named off a couple of different developments. Cumberland Estates uh, repaved Cumberland Drive in front of their development and added uh, curb and gutter along Cumberland Drive. Aiden Woods is doing the same thing along Crowcut. Um, Otter Creek did the same thing along Old Nashville Highway, and so. So is that scope included in this discussion as far as the road improvements defined in the? Uh, those improvements are not included um, in their traffic impact study as being required, and so they are not required in this case. It would, whatever they build has to be the city standard. So if the city standard is curb and gutter, then, then it would be curb and gutter, I think, is the answer to that question. I don't, I don't think Mr. Henry would disagree with that. It's whatever the city road standards are. That's, that, that would be the improvement. That's right. My, my, D.R. Horton has no problem improving to the current standard of curb and gutter and, and fresh paving in front of their property on Northwest Highway. The issue because that's that helps them right it makes it's their it's curb appeal literally curb appeal for the home buyers that would want to live in Bellhaven um, the issue has always been and I'll just I'll restate it does it make sense for the developer to go out there and make those improvements when the city's contemplating widening Northwest Highway to 55 feet of right-of-way three lanes which may need more right-of-way than, than you currently have. And, and D.R. Horton, by the way, is willing to dedicate right-of-way for that roadway project. That's, that's right-of-way the city doesn't have to acquire to do its project. Henry, so is that dedication that, already written into some scope of work? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the sorry, question. Is that dedication of right-of-way written into any agreement now between the development and the city? It'll come with the plat that comes to this body. The subdivision plat, when it comes to this body, will address But it's that related to the road improvements either way, right? No, we're, we're, yeah, the traffic impact study that we're talking about are off-site. So directly in front of the property is really considered part of the site. We're talking, you know, what, what we're talking about right now, we're talking about right in front of the property. The traffic impact study talks about off-site improvements, off-site. Okay. So, and I apologize, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I just want to make sure, Mr. King, we, we resolve his question. So... Yeah, and, I, and I'm, uh, your question was on scope of scope of. Yeah, work. and I mean, I mean, I guess that's where going with this is kind of back to your original, Mr. Henry. Your one of your original questions is just a better definition of this scope of work of what uh, what it entails, and not so much of an open checkbook. Uh, to me, makes sense. I, I would love to hear the opinion of the rest of the commission of um, of what a modification would look like. I, I, the last question, I think. Um, for the city staff would be is just a clarification the uh, stoplight in the intersection of 96 and Northwest Highway is that something the city is planning to put in or is that a TDOT improvement that is coming through that is currently part of a city project that is ongoing uh, aligning Northwest Highway with Highway 96 and adding a signalized intersection okay 
Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's really all I have. Again, I, I think a modification makes sense. Um, I'd love to hear from anybody else from their thoughts on that. Ms. Um, I have a question. In the past, when there has been um, a condition that a sidewalk has to be built in front of something and it really isn't needed and they give it to you to use later, is this comparable? referring to the sidewalk fund because we often vote on that impact, correct? Comparable to the extent that you can require a sidewalk if it, if it services the development and is related to the development and the development is expected to have walking traffic. So a sidewalk in a residential development would be an appropriate requirement, but a sidewalk in an industrial zone would, would not be appropriate. It would be, I think it would be an unlawful exact, exact, exactation. And also typically I think that's when the applicant is requesting to not construct the sidewalk and rather contribute to the sidewalk fund. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it is almost that shared use requirement. Um, Mr. Greer, sorry, I thought you were going to contribute to that. Okay. Anything else, Ms. Schilling? Mr. McDonald. Thank you. I went back and watched our last meeting from December um, just to refresh my own memory on exactly what that conversation looked like. There was a part where there was a lot of conversation around the traffic study and individuals had disbelief the traffic study was 100% accurate with theoretical traffic flow versus reality. Once people get there, the roads that they'll decide to use to get to different areas of town, that that, that might not have been captured within the traffic study. Uh, Mr. Owen, who's not here tonight, made mention that um, after each phase that you all, within your development, that an additional traffic study would be completed one, to, I guess, cement the findings of the prior traffic study, but also make any adjustments that are needed if there are any. And at that time, he's not here tonight. He's part of your crew. I think he's one of the engineers said that we would be, I think, to quote him exactly, we would be in complete agreement with that. I noticed on the email that you had additional traffic studies after phases was not listed as something that it just wasn't on there. Um, is that something that you are still open to? Yeah, I believe condition number two. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it on there? Covers, covers okay. that. And so, so yes, uh, my client's completely uh, open and screen. willing to comply with, with condition number two. And, email that they had. and in addition to that, the, the, the traffic light at Highway 96 and Northwest Highway, the traffic engineer says if if TDOT will not basically, if TDOT will not approve that traffic light because there's not enough traffic coming through that intersection at that time, my client, D.R. Horton, will continue to update that, that tra it's called a traffic warrant analysis, traffic light warrant analysis. They will continue to do that annually, every year. And so that may, not, that may not coincide with a phase. A phase may be one year and maybe two years later. But, but every year, that traffic light is going to be a, a new traffic light warrant analysis will be conducted to determine if it's time to turn that traffic light on. Thank you. Um, apologies for missing that. I was still, where, you said the second point on here? No, it's the second condition of the original. Yeah. The condition that they're wanting to remove. That's the third. That's the third. They're just, the okay, second. Roger. So the earlier you spoke about the, um, now, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess the cooperation between your project and the city when doing a, a, a roadway improvement that it can get messy, right? When the right hand's doing something and the left hand's doing something. So if there was some sort of agreement come to tonight that would adjust this, how would we ensure that those problems wouldn't come in the future? Because this would leave you to do your improvements separate from the city and whatever the city plans to do in that area, correct? That's right. That's correct. And so the way I've seen this in other jurisdictions get worked out is when the when the final plat comes forward, 
and each final plat will come in at, at different phases. That's the time to look at what's the city doing at the moment? Has the city funded their project? Is the city under construction? Is the contractor out there doing it? And so it requires close coordination at that point in time. Right. Uh, because as you know, the, the Planning Commission establishes a bond and a performance agreement for all the public infrastructure that's being installed. Roads, water, you know, electricity, whatever, uh, all of that you know, stuff. So it does require close coordination and that, that typically occurs during the final plat stages, which is multi-phased. I appreciate that response. Um, I guess for me, the reason I made the motion to deny um, is, as stated previously by I think a handful of individuals in the room now, this is an appointed body. We're not accountable to the citizens. We're not put here by the citizens or removed by the, or removed by the citizens. And when we're faced with something like this, um, for such a large development, the impact unknown, we have a traffic study that we can reference, but that's about all we have to go off of what, how that is gonna change that area. Um, and I know it's gone to the BOC more than once for that discussion to come to an agreement. I guess it just puts on me, it's, I, I'm, I find it to be uncomfortable that, that this body is faced with such a large decision that could have a, a pretty sizable impact on the city of Fairview, both financially and functionality wise, um, which is why I, I know it's not possible to have it go to the BOC to make the decision. Um, but it seems as if the buck has been passed back to this body uh, to, to just be the, you know, the, the buck's passed back here and stops here. And I just, I find that to be um, unfortunate. But my reason for the, for the denial, I do feel that there is impact of some level. We can, you know, debate what that might be. And I know the traffic studies show what it shows. And I was in favor personally of the, of the agreements that have come before, um, and, and to and to allow such a large development without any contributions outside of the bare minimum um, just seems inappropriate for me. That's just my opinion. Mr. Chairman, I have just a few comments. Um, obviously, I wasn't on the board in December, um, did not get a chance to act on the application. I do think it's important that I weigh in tonight on the motion, so I just do want to get on the record. If I had been on the board in December, I would not have voted for it. I don't believe the plans are in substantial compliance. I believe they trigger three out of the eight conditions. Another important thing, in December, everything that was focused on was substantial compliance and even you go back and look at the, I didn't watch the video I went back and read the meeting minutes from December and some of the Planning Commission members even asked about other parts of our ordinance and different things and they were instructed that you have to just focus on substantial compliance and that that just seems incorrect to me when you look at 10-203.4 um, action by the Planning Commission on site development plans and subdivisions it's, it's a two-step process. Um, first is substantial compliance. Second is considering all new information that wasn't previously considered must be reviewed and determined um, to quality and compliance with the substantive requirements of this ordinance. Um, and, and so it should have been a two-step process. And, and uh, everything I read in the meeting minutes and I intended it, um, that, that, was, that instruction was not given to the Planning Commission. I think the vote might have turned out differently if, if that had been talked about. And, you know, there's several parts of the underlying ordinance that these plans don't satisfy and were never mentioned in the controlling document. So I, I just want to get that on the record because that's how I would have, that's something I would have brought up in the December meeting. Um, to talk about the motion that's on the table right now, I, I don't think it's appropriate we remove it. I think any time an action is taken with conditions, you have no way to know if that underlying action, that approval would have happened if this condition was not there. And for that reason alone, I think it's important now that there's different people on this body and we're not able to reconsider all the plans, according to Mr. Carter, that 
we, we have to leave it in place. And I, I also feel it's very important that there is a development agreement. On, this is one of the largest projects, if not the largest in, in the history of Fairview. There needs to be a development agreement to address all the things that were brought up right away, sidewalks, different pieces. You know, that's, that's very common in this stuff. Um, and, you know, we've talked a lot tonight about how this board is not really the one, is not the board that negotiates development agreements. Um, so I, I think it's very important that we, we leave the condition in place. Um, one thing I will point out with what was submitted to us tonight, the memo, there's been a lot of discussion that the city is going to make these improvements. And even if Bellhaven never happens, that the, um, you know, the roads still need these improvements. One, nothing is for sure that the city will make those improvements. We're working on plans now, but nothing has been finalized. Nothing has been done. So there is the possibility that those plans won't ever happen. Things come up, funding drops out, whatever. So we can't assume that when we act tonight. The other thing is, um, you know, there's a little bit of a discrepancy in the two things that were submitted. When you look at the Reagan Smith memo by Ms. Reed and you look at the second paragraph, everybody keeps saying that these improvements are warranted even if Bellhaven doesn't happen. But you guys are leaving out two words uh, right in the second sentence, kind of in the middle. It says the improvements are projected to be warranted even if Bellhaven does not happen. So that's not a definitive fact that these are warranted if, if, if nothing happens out there. I drive that road every day, and I could argue if none of these developments happen, we don't need any improvements. Um, again, it says are, are projected to, and those improvements are warranted based on everything that Reagan Smith assumed was going to happen that's been talked about. If nothing happens, then maybe none of them are warranted, and maybe Bellhaven drives the whole thing. We would have to redo the traffic study, and I think that's a suggestion I would make to the Board of Commissioners is to consider having an independent traffic study done um, in negotiating the development agreement. Um, th there's other things like Elrod Road and looking at our standards, Elrod's fallen apart completely. And if, if our standards are gutters on both sides, by the time you put those gutters in, you're going to have to put drainage in because that's why the road's falling apart. And then you're going to have to repave the whole thing. So that's significant improvements. And I think there's a lot of things that, that kind of justify the, the Board of Commissioners wanting more. Now, we, we, I think, my, again, my recommendation would be to put more science on it. But I think we have to keep this condition in place. I think we have to let the Board of Commissioners work it out. I hate to put it on them. Uh, you know, I'd be glad to help in any way. But I think we need to look at, you know, doing another traffic study, looking more in depth at all the city standards and really seeing what's and, and you have to forget all the other developments for a minute because we, we don't know if anything's going to happen. And you got to go back to that our projected words, those two words right there. And, and potentially look at a traffic study with nothing else but Bellhaven and, and see what else is required and, and not, and, and just go into that. So for all those reasons, I think it's important that, that, that we pass the motion that's on the floor to not remove the condition. So. Uh, yeah, so uh, Ms. Schilling, what the motion is to deny so. removing the condition. Um, so in a moment we will deny and then if, if it doesn't pass then we we can amend the, with a different emotion if so be okay i'm just going to pose a hypothetical question and i'd like for this input to be given to me from the city staff and, and the rest of the planning commission if there's potential time delay in allowing this development to begin to begin is there any impact to allowing phase one to, to commence while the development agreement is in progress with some stipulations applied to that? Understanding we've, we've all talked about some additional traffic studies. Um, what, what impact would that have against us risk-wise, either from a liability standard, Mr. Patrick, or from a constructability the condition that was placed on uh, resolution 4023 is a development agreement approval required by the Board of Commissioners regarding share of road improvements before any final plat is recorded. A final plat is typically recorded prior to a project going vertical and uh, platting out the individual lots. And so that condition was left on there as being um, somewhat open to allow the development to begin with their grading work and tree removal and begin installing infrastructure within the development and having an agreement 
prior to the recording of the final plot of the first phase. Thank you, Mr. Greer. So, Mr. Henry, from a developer standpoint, what does your schedule show for when you go vertical? I have to get someone else to answer that question. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Patrick Pitts with DR Horton, Land Acquisition Manager. Um, uh, I understand your question. Is it going to we, – we would have probably a year and a half or so of land development before we would start actually building homes. Um, are you asking me if we would start that work before a development agreement is in place? Yes, sir. I don't see how that would be very prudent for the developer to undertake that kind of expense, knowing that this open-ended condition is hanging out there. Just want to make sure that we're all and looking I, at I every would, every avenue here. Well, I'm going to explain uh, my reaction for tonight. I, just as a, as a reiteration of what we've talked about, this commission does not discuss terms and conditions as far as costs related to projects. Uh, we rely on the Board of Commissioners to, to have completed that. I understand there is, uh, has been some negotiations between the developers and the Board of Commissioners with a subjectivity of what satisfaction truly is. It sounds to me like currently there's there's not a time impact on the project um, from what I've heard tonight. Um, there, there should have been ample time with the initial agreement issued in that there was a delay from our De December um, implication of this condition. Uh, five months uh, passed by before the initial development agreement was presented. I understand there's been two rounds, but the only two rounds and, um, you know, we're just now talking about the request of this removal 10 months later. In my opinion, this is a Board of Commissioners discussion. Um, they have that legislative requirement. Our, our commission here can, cannot establish that. I currently do not see any other means or methods of modifications to the condition. Um, but I would certainly welcome if anybody has any, any last thoughts, comments. All right, thank you, sir. So the motion on the table was to deny the request to remove the, the condition that we applied in December, which means the condition will remain and that the developer and the Board of Commissioners must still negotiate and enter into a development agreement as we established in December based on the information, based on the voting that took place in December and the information that we had to make our decisions on, on that discussion. So uh, would you please call the vote? Mr. McDonald? Yes. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Pape? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Schilling? No. Ms. Williams? No. Mr. Magner? Aye. Mayor Anderson? Aye. Motion carries six to two. The condition will remain for the Board of Commissioners to negotiate. Next item on the agenda is PC Resolution PC-3524. Adopt Planning Commission schedule for February 2025 through February of 2026. Make a motion to approve PC 35-24. Allie? Second. McDonald? Yes, sir. Mr. Greer, would you please um, help us take a look at this? Welcome to our small version of Rocket Science our wonderful calendar for February of 2025 through February of 2026. 
our current calendar runs uh, and picks up January of 25. The earliest submission date on that is in November. And so wanted to try to get ahead and plan out for the next year so that we would have appropriate dates in place. I know the November meeting, there were a couple of people who were not going to be able to make it. So uh, there was a calendar included in your packet and there were a couple uh, changes that were made and a calendar was provided to you tonight. The April Planning Commission meeting I had scheduled uh, for the third Tuesday in April. The correct date is uh, April 8th, 2025 is the second Tuesday in April. And then uh, the November Planning Commission calendar, I had that scheduled uh, for November the 11th, which is Veterans Day. And I moved that date to the third Tuesday, which would be November the 18th. One of the changes that we've made uh, from our current year going into next year is currently we operate on a six-week calendar uh, for our staff. So applicants submit their project six weeks prior to it coming before you as a planning commission. That has had its challenges um, with our staff and our limitations to try to schedule meetings with applicants and uh, get everything accomplished within that six week calendar. And so we have added an additional week in to make it a seven week calendar. Uh, our initial project submittal deadline is seven weeks prior to the meeting. Uh, that gives us a week to review the project submittal. Then we have a staff applicant meeting uh, that myself, Mr. Chasteen, Mr. Broadbent all sit in. Uh, Fire Chief sits in, Mayor Anderson sits in as a member of the Planning Commission and Board of Commissioners to represent both boards. And uh, the applicants receive staff comments back three weeks after their initial project submittal. So we review it for three weeks to begin with, they get staff comments back. And then we added a week in there um, for their responses back to us. They previously had one week. They now will have 14 days between receiving our staff comments and their responses back. We had heard from some applicants and due to our staff, we had missed our deadline a few different times. And this gives us a little bit of buffer room in there. Uh, we also added a column of determination of submittal completion. And that is the Friday before packets go out. It's one week after their final submittal where we as a staff will sit down and make sure and go through all of the submittal and determine and uh, uh, let each applicant know if their submittal packet is complete prior to it coming to the Planning Commission. We currently do that operation, but it was not defined in the calendar. And so I wanted to make sure that was a defined date. PC packets go out uh, one week prior to the Planning Commission meeting and then each night prior to the Planning Commission are the available work session dates. If an applicant so chooses to have a work session, we post those uh, along with our Planning Commission meeting as a calendar openly at the beginning of the year so that we are not uh, randomly and uh, surprisingly placing work session dates onto your agenda. And so that's kind of a quick breakdown. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Mr. Greer. Personally, I think seven weeks is extremely reasonable. I think a lot of jurisdictions in the state maybe even go up to, to eight weeks. You know, 60-day cycle is, is not uncommon. So given the amount of work that we're experiencing here, I would personally say that's um, still commendable, very much so. Comments, questions? All right. Will you please call the vote? Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. McDonald? Aye. Mr. Pate? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Schilling? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Magner? Aye. Mayor Anderson? Aye. Motion carries to approve schedule for uh, next year. Thank you very much, Mr. Greer. We have uh, no bonds or letters of credit. Moving on, we will talk about uh, reports and discussions by uh, department. So city planning, Mr. Greer. Thank you all for your wonderful consideration tonight and the folks that attended training. Thanks for coming out. That training was recorded. If you were not here, I'm happy to provide the training for you. Um, 
we will have another training coming up on December 10th. That training will be at 5 p.m. Mr. Carter, welcome back to uh, the States. While you were out, we did schedule a training with your office. Uh, Mr. Hogan confirmed that we will be having a training that will be open to the Board of Commissioners, the Board of Zoning Appeals, and the Planning Commission. Uh, the topics that I asked him, Mr. Carter's group, to to specifically touch on were Robert's Rules of Order and the areas of interest that each board should be utilizing for their decision making. Uh, I'm sure that they will have a lot of fun, awesome topics that are very engaging for you to listen to that night. He's setting, he's setting the, uh, really <laughs> and so uh, just wanted to let you be aware. I will send out an email with that once we get a little bit closer to that. But December 10th at 5 p.m. right here at City Hall. Um, it will be open to the public. We'll have as many folks as we can, potentially some new faces uh, with the election coming up in November. Uh, if there are new Board of Commissioners that are elected, there will be a great opportunity for them to learn as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, City Manager, Mr. Doherty. I just wanted to say one thing tonight. I just, each and every one of you, I appreciate your service to our community. Just want to say thank you. Thank you, sir. City Engineering. City no Engineering comments. has no report tonight. Okay, great. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Mr. Carter, City Attorney. As far as the training, if there's specific areas or questions that you have that you'd like to be part of that, let me know. Um, I, I think in addition to what Ethan said, we we probably also should talk about vested property rights. And so if there's other things are curious about or want to know more about, please email me or, or Josh Hogan, and we can add it to our, uh, our list. Um, and, and, uh, we'll be working on that, so just, just let us know. All right, thank you. Uh, Planning Commission, starting with Mr. Pape. I just wanted to say um, big shout out and great job to the staff for putting together Cotapalooza and working with TPUDC. I think it was a great event, um, good attendance. We just got to keep going, get as much of the community involved, but um, great start, looking forward to that. Um, so just great job by the staff and congratulations. And, and I know that took a lot to pull that off. So well done, um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pape, um, Mr. McDonald. Uh, just thank you to Mr. Chastain for the training tonight. That was uh, it's always good to have that refresher, and have an opportunity to ask questions about our role and how we uh, serve the city. So I appreciate it. Thank you. That's all. Kelly, I just echo what these two gentlemen said. Thanks to the staff. Uh, starting down at the end, Mr. King. Yeah, just uh, thank you again, Kevin, for, for the training. Really informative, and to the staff for always being. Um, very thorough in their in their reports and and being able to answer any questions we have. Miss Williams, I have to concur. The training was good this evening. Thank you. I was able to learn a lot today, and um, we're doing some difficult work, but we're doing work for thinking for it in the future. So I appreciate everybody on the board and the leadership today. Miss Schilling. I missed it, I'm sorry, but I do want to say we will, meet, we will not meet again until the election is over. So tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to put it up on Facebook, I am endorsing Dr. LaRonda Williams for our state seat, and um, I think it's just important. I'd love to have somebody who lives here, knows what we need to represent us. That's it. Mayor Anderson. I want to thank our staff. Our police officers who always keep us safe in our meetings. Bree for doing all of our visual aids. Thank you. And Mr. Carter for all you do. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. I just echo all the comments. Uh, I'll take a motion for adjournment. Motion. motion.